Hello everybody. Today I would like to take a look at this doctrine called um, once saved always saved. Um, actually I don't really think it's an official church doctrine today but anyway the doctrine has been around for a long time already and this time I actually think I'm not going to give you just one answer. So, because to be honest, I have a difficult time to decide what theology around this topic is most waterproof. So instead, I would like to look at this topic from two sides. Um, I also want to assure you that I'm, I do not intend to make you doubt your salvation. I'm fully convinced that the grace of God is much greater than our limited capacity to explain how and why he does things. So even when I say I'm critical about a certain teaching, I'm still convinced that the Bible speaks truth when it says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No human being will ever be able, not you and not I, to fully explain God's amazing works, right? All we can do is thinking of some nice theories and hope that our theory somehow manages to explain at least a bit of that what we believe. Um, some of our theories have become doctrines and it has stood the test of time. Mostly the established and confirmed Protestant doctrines are there to stay as they explain best what we as Christians believe. But other ideas are still being debated. But having a different opinion on them doesn't really affect your position in Christ. For example, um, in one church women are allowed to preach, while somewhere else this is not okay. And I believe in neither case we will lose our salvation because we think differently on that topic. Um, I think it is the same with the idea of once saved, always saved. In both cases we can be assured that Christ's work was enough to get us saved in the first place. The biggest difference is that the one group says that you can lose your salvation while, uh, when you willingly turn your back on Jesus, uh, for example when you openly become an atheist for example, um, while the other group says that even then you won't lose it. Both groups teach that it is unwise to turn your back on Christ and both groups teach that we should always stay close to him. So if you're struggling with your faith and if you think God doesn't want you in, then I suggest reading the Bible and don't trust your feeling. Repent of your sin, call upon the Lord Jesus and he will save you. That is his promise. How we humans try to explain this work doesn't really matter. What matters is that it just works. Jesus is Savior. So, let us look at the early Christians in the first and second centuries. Already they knew about this idea of once saved, always saved. The early church fathers were quite busy determining um, uh, what teachings were biblical and which of these teachings were not. You see, in the old works of these church fathers, we see a group called uh, agnostics uh, popping up um, quite often. The Gnostics were divided in many sects, and one uh, uh, in different groups at this, right? One of these sects of uh, uh, Gnostics taught the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Irenaeus, uh, who lived um, in 130 to 202 after Christ, bowed his head over this idea and he wrote a book titled Against Heresies, in which he is actually discussing this doctrine. But before I continue, I think uh, it would be helpful to quote some of his work. So it's rather a long quote, but here we go. But as to themselves, they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly saved, not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual by nature. For just as it is impossible that material substance should partake of salvation, since indeed they maintain that it is incapable of receiving it, so again it is impossible that the spiritual substance, by which they mean themselves, should ever come under the power of corruption, whatever the sort of actions in which they indulge. For even as gold, when submerged in filth, loses not on that account its beauty, 
but retains its own native qualities, the filth having no power to injure the gold. So they affirm that they cannot in any measure suffer hurt or lose their spiritual substance, whatever the material actions in which they may be involved. Wherefore also it comes to pass that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all those kind of forbidden deeds of which the scripture assures us that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And committing many other uh, abominations and impieties, they run us down who from the fear of God guard against sinning even in thought or word as utterly contempt contemptible and ignorant persons, while they highly exalt themselves and claim to be perfect and the elect seed, for they declare that we simply receive grace for us, uh, for, uh, for, you, uh, for use, sorry. wherefore also it will again be taken away from us, but that they themselves have grace as their own special possession, which has descended from above by means of an unspeakable and undescribable conjunction. And on this account, more will be given them. Okay, I admit, the language can be a bit difficult to understand. I mean, I, I've got difficulties to pronounce it even. So I'll quote someone most of us know, Mr. Billy Graham, Brother Graham. He said, when we do sin, God does not reject us or de disown us. Our fellowship with him may be broken, but our relationship is not. We are still members of his family if we have truly committed our lives to Christ. So basically, the idea of once saved, always saved, saved seems to be mostly popular in uh, Calvinistic circles. Um, I, I have seen it outside these circles, uh, circles as well, but mostly within Calvinistic circles. If we look at the quote as given by Brother Graham, uh, we see quite some similarities between, between that what uh, the Gnostics said and that what the Calvinists teach. Both seem to explain that when a person is saved, it is not by means of his own effort, but on account of his or her nature. While Gnostics and Calvinists differ in uh, the origin of, the, of that nature, the doctrine is still the same. Gnostics say that it is due to a special spiritual nature and Calvinists say that they are infused by the nature of Christ. So let's see whether we can find more agreements between the two groups, that is between the Gnostics and the Calvinists. Okay, in the first thing I found is in Calvinism someone is only saved when he or she is elected. The Gnostics said that they were of the elect seed. So both teach that once you've been elected, you can do nothing to undo that state of being saved. And then the third part of the Westminster Confession of Faith says that Christians will not lose their salvation even if they live in such a way whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, come to deprived in some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened and their consciences, consciences wounded, hurt and scandalized others. While a Christian might say that a real Christian doesn't want to sin, the Gnostics may, uh, made sinning their preferred lifestyle. And then, no sin can come between grace. It does not matter how that person personally relates to that sin. Calvinists say that Nobody can resist that grace given by the Lord and the chosen person will be bound by that grace. Gnostics basically say that it didn't matter whether they freely sinned because grace would automatically cover every sin they commit. And then finally I saw this. Both Calvinists and Gnostics believe that someone who is saved can never ever lose their salvation whatever they do. Like I said, the Gnostics accept the ultimate conclusion and indulge in their own lusts and passions. Calvinists say that the Christian who is saved generally does not want to live like an unbeliever, but even though if they do, they cannot lose their salvation. So, why this comparison, you might ask? So, 
let me be really really clear here i have many good friends who hold a more calvinistic view on salvation than i do and they are my brothers and sisters and we love each other dearly however i still wanted to make this comparison between the teaching on salvation simply because many aspects seem to be very similar in other words the similarities between the teachings of the gnostics and the idea of one saved always saved are so many that I think it would be unfair to ignore it. Now, I do want to stress that most who hold this teaching as true will not agree on the uh, Gnostic approach of just sin as much as possible. My, my Calvinistic friends, like I, are disgusted by this idea which comes very close actually to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Uh, Jesus himself turned against the group, uh, this group of Nicolaitans in Revelation 2. Nicolaitans basically taught that to fully experience the grace of God, you first have to fall as deep as possible in order for you to understand how big his salvation is. The Nicolaitans taught their new follow followers, who actually just accepted Christ as their savior, to go and sin as hard as possible. Only then they could appreciate the gift they were given by God. Now the Calvinists do not accept this teaching of the Nicolaitans and neither do I and they will go as far as to say that these people cannot be real Christians and I actually agree on that when one becomes a Christian that person wants to serve the Lord and wants to turn away from sin so how about the Bible I am sure that none of my friends will agree that this teaching comes close to that of the Gnostics Mostly they come up with some good biblical arguments for this teaching. And you know, here it becomes a little bit more complicated, for me at least, because these biblical arguments seem to be pretty strong. They, are, uh, they mostly come up with many texts uh, that seem to defend the once saved, always saved doctrine. And I will just quote two of them, but there are many more. The first one comes from Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 38 to 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then the second Bible verse is from John chapter 6, 39 to 40. This is Jesus speaking. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and will raise him up at the last day. So, in theology, uh, we mostly use um, a simple principle when it comes to texts like this. When we have several Bible texts on a topic like salvation for example and we find that some of these texts can be explained only one way and some other texts can be explained in both directions then we normally read the text that can have two explanations in a way which is coherent with the verses that can have only one explanation the two examples i actually gave earlier romans um, and john are considered by the proponents of of this doctrine as text that can have only one meaning. In other words, whenever we find a text that seems to give the possibility to explain in both ways, we should choose to explain them in line with these texts I just mentioned. But honestly, when I look at John 6, 39 to 40, for example, I have not much difficulty seeing both explanations. Yes, Jesus clearly says that he will raise those up who have been given to him by the Father, but likewise in verse 40, 40 he says that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And for me it's not hard to explain that we need to keep our eyes on him, and that we need to continue to believe in him. And by doing so, Jesus will do what he says, he will raise you up at the last day. So now what? See what I mean? I mean, it's pretty easy to doubt the once saved, always saved doctrine. But does this mean that we have to worry all the time? Um, and I absolutely believe 
there is no reason to worry. Both, both the proponents and the opponents firmly believe that salvation comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. Both parties believe we should live godly lives to honor God the Father. However, the opponents are mostly a little bit more worried about their friends who turned their backs on the Lord, for example. They will try to win them back for Christ. As for those who believe this doctrine, they, not, not all, mostly say that this person was never a real Christian in the first place, else he would not have turned his back on God. A real Christian can never fall away, they say. And my difficulty with this idea is that I have seen several people turn away, and some of them have been fully enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So were they fake Christians? Were the things we've seen in their lives not real? Uh, have we all been fooled in thinking it was the Holy Spirit who gave them these remarkable dreams and gifts? And now Hebrews says, because they have been fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. We are not talking about people who just have a bit of a crisis in their lives here. I mean, I'm not worried about those who struggle to keep their prayer life vigilant. I'm not even worried when you go through a dry season concerning your faith. I mean, we all all been there, we are there, or we will have those periods in our lives. God knows us, and He loves us dearly, and He will not drop you at the first doubtful thought. I strongly believe that we can only get saved by faith alone and not by our works. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace uh, are ye saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But you know, I do fear God enough not to purposely walk away from Him and purposely deny Him. This is, for me, this is just common sense. You see, when you struggle to keep your prayer life alive, it is because you have this desire to do so, right? I mean, you want to have a good prayer life. That is healthy for a Christian. It's also healthy to have the desire to be close with God the Father, and it feels rather uncomfortable to stray away. I would say that this is the work of His Holy Spirit who is in you. But if one believes this doctrine of once saved, always saved, and does not regard sin to be uh, something terrible because he thinks he's safe already, I would urge that person to reconsider his position. I have seen this attitude among Christians. I mean, really, there are really people who think this to be a good idea. I clearly remember a guy who just told me that he wasn't planning to tell people about the gospel simply because it was up to God whether they would be saved or not. Also, he said that he didn't have to stop his sinful lifestyle because he, one time in the past, gave himself to Christ to be saved. God is good and he will forgive people um, when people actually genuinely repent and confess their sins to them. But I would not bet on the idea he is doing the same when one is actively pursued, um, pursuing a life of sin. In either situation, a true Christian is regenerated in Christ and this should motivate him to stop sinning and to war against his sin and to honor God in all of his ways. So a little motivation here. If you are saved but haven't been living like a Christian should, then I would like to encourage you to get yourself back in relationship with God. The gospel, um, which with its message of salvation, is not really different in Turkey or Australia or wherever. The content of the gospel has been the same for centuries and throughout the whole world. It never changed. If you are saved and say you follow Jesus, you'll have to be obedient to that same message, the gospel, which has been taught by Jesus himself and later his disciples and all the people throughout, the his throughout history. God is being glorified and honored by his children who obey the gospel wholeheartedly. So, I guess this topic will stir up some feelings. Um, maybe it even did raise some eyebrows. Tell me just what you think about this idea of once saved, always saved. Maybe you agree, maybe you don't. So, 
maybe you can post some other Bible verses in the comments below here in the, in the in the video section or maybe on my website. I mean that would be great. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, but please keep it brotherly. I mean we're not going to 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 go we're not going to war with each other, right? Okay. And you can also check out the description of this video. There you'll find um, a link to my Odyssey channel. Um, and you can also check out my other channels on Gap TV, uh, Float and BitChute. Not that these channels differ too much from each other, because in the end they mostly have the same content, but this way I'm sure that there is not just one party who can delete my videos on <laughs> YouTube. Anyway, thank you very much for your prayers and support. You can look in the description again of this video or on my website to find out how you can help me. And you'll find a link there to both the Dutch and the English transcripts of this video. So God bless you. Thank you for watching. And Lord willing, we'll see each other in the next video. Thank you for watching this video. You can give me a thumbs up if you liked it. You can also subscribe to my channel or even better, follow me on Odyssey. That way you will never miss a new video. You will find all the links in the description below.